second stage renal disease is when the kidneys have lost their natural function. So, kidneys, so what does the kidneys do in the body? Anyone? Purifying? It is, yeah, it is not technically purifying, it is rather ex excretion. All the waste products that, ha that, uh, that have been generated in the body is removed by the kidney. So, once the kidneys fail, so your blood will again contain all these waste products that will adversely harm every, every other organ in the body. So, this naturally the kidney does it and as long as the kidney is fine, it's okay. But end stage renal disease is an irrecoverable loss of kidney function. So, this happens for around, I mean, so there is globally 3 million cases reported which and it is growing at a rate of 7 to 8 percent. So, because a, a, a patient who has an end stage renal disease, they have to undergo some kind of a treatment to remove these uh, products from blood or remove these waste metabolize or waste products from blood. So, there are several renal and these are called renal replacement therapy. So, instead of your renal or instead of kidney, these are some replacement therapies. So, that could be hemodialysis, which we are going to cover in this section where the blood is taken outside the body, purified and or extracorporeally it is purified and sent back to the body. Or it can be used, I mean, uh, another mode is peritoneal dialysis. So, peritoneal dialysis is the peritoneal lining. So, below the abdomen, like that peritoneal lining itself is used or the patient's own peritoneal lining is used uh, to treat the uh, way or to, or to remove the waste metabolites. Hemofiltration, hemodiafiltration is something that involves some kind of absorbers that absorb components from blood and Hemodiafiltration means, so you all have all come across diafiltration in the previous classes, right? So, what was diafiltration? Huh. So, what was diafiltration? Yeah, a volume that has been removed as a permeate, that additional volume is, is, being, uh, is being added. So, the advantage of uh, diafiltration is that I mean, you can run it at applied pressure, so it is faster, but there, there will be excess water loss, which is replaced as or the buffer that the body loses is replaced artificially or extra and, and the best form of the renal replacement therapy is definitely the kidney transplant where you get a donor kidney, which exactly matches and you don't have any other side inf infections or complications from it. But the number of kidneys available or people uh, volunteering to uh, donate kidney or the matching that is very rare so but that is the best form where you get a natural kidney that replaces your kidney which which was not working okay so among these hemodialysis is one of the most popular renal replacement therapies and it's being it's being done for now over centuries so the first ones were done as early as in the 18th century where they used a pig skin so, this was uh, generally not used exactly for uh, like how it is used today. So, uh, during wars, the soldiers used to get wounded and that wounds used to get infected. So, they had found that if the membranes are passed through a pig skin, they can remove some of the uh, these bacteria and some of these microorganisms that cause these infections. So, from there it has evolved over time to remove any unwanted metabolites and excess water that the body produces. So, the kidney not just metabolites, it also produces, um, it also removes excess water in the form of urine, yes. <coughs> so, it uh, removes accumulated toxins, excess ions, water from the blood and uh, insufficient essential ions are replenished uh, from the dialysate. So, the kidney, okay, I don't know anyone from a biology background. Yes, so you know that there, it, there is, it loses ions, then when it comes back, it reabsorbs the ions. Yes, so a natural kidney does that, whereas artificially that it is not possible to do that by membrane-based separation, where only separation happens. So anything, any essential ions or any, basically sodium, uh, sodium to, potassium ratio basically any sodium potassium that the uh, that the body loses it is replenished by from the dialysate side so you have the blood side and you have the dialysate side right so hemodialysis is the largest market for membranes 
today even it 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 is a very close competition even to reverse osmosis membranes because the amount of membranes used or the membrane area used per year so unlike reverse osmosis membrane which a single membrane module lasts for years this uh, this is uh, not exactly okay in in europe they use it as a one time use so basically one time a dialyzer or a, or a membrane is used for separation and then the membrane is thrown in india they use it uh, maybe one to two weeks so depending on three to four sessions of dialysis so hence it makes it the largest membrane market and the margin on these is very high uh, okay and then other part is in india the end stage renal uh, kidney uh, renal disease affects relatively younger people so anywhere from 40 to 55 compared to other parts of the world where older people where this uh, the kidney function loss is there maybe for much older people so here it happens for much younger people which again is a cause of concern uh, so this is very closely linked to diabetes so type 2 diabetes is very closely linked to uh, kidney failure and indian genes or indians as such are much more prone to catching diabetes or everyone would know someone who has diabetes even in your families or someone close by so that contributes to 63% of the end stage renal diseases in India. <clears throat> okay, so now comes to the question of, so what type of membranes do we want to use for uh, hemodialysis? So we had studied different pore sizes of membranes and different operating pressures. So, what type of membranes would you ideally want to use for hemodialysis? Yes, so it is ultra filtration membranes are used for hemodialysis where the pressures that are operated are not too high because if you operate too high, so these are all biological molecules, so shear force, so anything that shears against the walls of the hollow fibers uh, can damage it and it is and if it is too tight. Uh, the uh, metabolites or the contaminants that you want to remove may not pass through. So, ultra filtration and a very uh, and a very specific range of ultra filtration membranes are used. So, nowadays most of the or all all the dialysis or all the membranes that are used are hollow fiber membranes used as a hollow fiber membrane module. It started off with plate and frame or coil type, but today everything in the market is. Uh, hollow fiber okay and another point why it is important in today's context at least in India is none of the hemodialysis membranes or India does not manufacture any hemodialysis membrane so that is the main problem so and it is imported either from Japan or from US or from Singapore so these are three main manufacturers so obviously the cost associated with using an imported membrane is anyway always higher than using a uh, indigenous membrane or uh, ma in Indian made membrane. So there was a push from the government for the last three to five years on making all parts of this. So this has a, um, we are just going to today talk about the membrane aspect, but it has a system that takes out blood, recirculates the blood, checks for what are the ions missing and auto dilutes it or auto or, or pumps in the buffer or electrolytes that it's needed to replenish the blood. So, but we are just going to talk about the hemodialyzer uh, membrane, but the, the total system, so they want to make in India the total system. <clears throat> okay. So hemodialysis, so if you can see here is, is a thin selective barrier, like any membrane, it's a thin selective barrier. Okay. So in bio separations or in biomedical applications here, it is not like, <clears throat> it is not like our water treatment application. So in water treatment, you want to remove all kind of contaminants. There is no small contaminant, large contaminant. So if there are very large contaminants, you do a pre-filtration and then you remove all contaminants. Here you cannot, because it is your blood, you don't want to remove all the particles or all the molecules that are present in the blood. You should not lose the essential components like blood cells, your proteins, etc. or your uh, blood cells, etc. So, but you want to remove the metabolites, excess water, etc. from the blood. So it acts as a, a thin selective barrier between a blood side and a dialysis side that permits the transport of uremic toxins but retains essential blood components, proteins, etc. So uremic toxins is a general term given to all these kind of metabolites that have to be excreted. And the first one being urea or the most abundant one being urea, hence the term uremic toxins. 
So uremic toxins are of three types. You can have very low molecular weight and water soluble compounds which are generally less than 500 Daltons. You can have protein bound or lipid soluble compounds that are more difficult or you cannot remove them by hemodialysis. And you can have middle molecular weight compounds which are more than 500 Daltons and ranges anywhere up to uh, thousands of Daltons or sorry tens of thousands of Daltons which also have to be removed. And uh, so removing all the three together by a single membrane is generally not possible but you want to you have to remove your low molecular weight uh, solutes which are urea creatinine and you also have to remove or you also want to remove your middle molecular weight solutes or middle molecular weight toxins. So if you don't remove it then the frequency of your dialysis increases if you remove them then you have much lower frequency. The protein bound solutes and lipid soluble compounds cannot be removed by hemodialysis. I am not getting into that. So we have something known as a hemoperfusion where you use an adsorbent column to adsorb some of those compounds. <clears throat> the membranes uh, generally used or have that have been used over time, it obviously started with the cellulose or regenerated cellulose, uh, cuprofan, rayons, uh, saponified cellulose, est uh, ester. So these were all cellulose based or regenerated cellulose based membranes but the drawbacks were they had low flux and they induced something known as complement activation. So we will come to a little bit of what is complement activation. So complement activation is any negative, okay, <clears throat> complement activation very simply put is you have allergic reactions. So you have heard of an allergic reactions, right? So allergic reaction is your body not agreeing to something that has been inside the blood or on the surface of your skin which has again gone into your thing. So the the body is not agreeing with something or something that your blood has been in contact with. So that is that that is that starts from your complement activation and that can also finally even lead to death of a patient if your uh, if it I mean if the reaction is very bad it can even lead to death. So this started inducing complement activation which again so they are not much much used now substituted uh, cellulose membranes also i mean improved the complement activation but led to adsorption of proteins so adsorption of anything that your body requires is not feasible and adsorption of proteins for any type of uh, any type of membrane application is not required because you have obviously reduced the flux or reduce the uh, reduce its performance so nowadays synthetic membranes are used uh, initially again they start with polyacrylonitrile membranes but nowadays most uh, commonly used are polyether sulfone or polysulfone based uh, hollow fiber membranes. All, all the products that are except one, uh, one Japanese manufacturer all others they make only polysulfone or polyether sulfone based uh, membranes. So they are uh, they have bo so the disadvantage again is these uh, these are hydrophobic in nature. So since you are they are hydrophobic, any kind of proteins adsorbs by hydrophobic hydrophobic interaction. Uh, they are again because they are because they adsorb components, you start to lose its biocompatibility. And obviously, as with any process, it it requires anticoagulants. So anticoagulants something that prevents the blood from clotting. So if you seen if you have a wound so you have blood that flows out but after some time so you have fibrins fibrin strands okay i am not going too much into that so it forms a clot the same thing can happen when you take the blood out of your body and pass it through a membrane it can form a clot because it is not in its natural environment so you don't want that to happen so you have to continuously inject or dose the patient blood with anticoagulant so there are a lot of researches happening where they try to modify these membranes, either membranes, polymers or membrane surfaces to overcome all these drawbacks. So there are no perfect membranes but they have done modifications to minimize these effects. So you have in situ polymerization, surface modification, immobilization with some macromolecules or biological macromolecules, chemical surface treatment, surface grafting, blending, phospholipids. So they, they attach uh, vitamins or DNA that are blood active compounds onto the membrane surface 
and uh, now the most commonly seen one is blending of some or introduction of some nanoparticles which again improve some performance or the tailor the pore size of your membrane. So advantage of these researchers, I mean uh, research workers, so they decrease the hydrophobicity of the membrane, they tune the membrane pore size and they make it more biocompatible. So as uh, like not just clearance or not just selectivity, but also biocompatibility is a big issue here. <sighs> okay. So these membrane modules that you see, so you have something known as uh, the hydraulic permeability. So what is hydraulic permeability? So, so basically water flow per mmHg transmembrane pressure per r per meter square. So here the pressure is uh, noted in millimeter of Hg or, or mercury rather than in psi or this thing because the the flow the systems that you that that house or that uh, you, uh, that control the hemodialysis is very small i mean the the pressure ranges are very small and hence somewhere between 200 to 350 mmhg is the uh, for an adult person uh, that is the range of pressure that can be applied so it is not like your uh, normal ultra filtration or nano filtration where if you apply much more force you will get much more permeate you cannot do that because you will uh, you will kill the patient in the end so, but you want to again remove as much as water as possible per pass because otherwise the patient is on hemodialysis longer. So, so there is associated fatigues or any kind of uh, any kind of reactions that occur when the patient is undergoing this hemodialysis for much longer. So, they want to reduce the hemodialysis time like for one this thing. Okay. So, they are the membranes based on the hydraulic permeability, they are classified as low flux if your uh, water flow is less than 10. So, it is high flux if it is between 21 to 60 and super flux. So, these super fluxes are rarely seen in hemodialysis, but maybe in hemodia filtration. But all membrane manufacturers are trying to move to high flux. So, that is anywhere about 10 or about, sorry, anywhere about 20. Uh, ml per mmHg per hour per meter square. So that much of water removal rate. Uh, so if your membrane has very small pores, it will remove small uh, small metabolites or like urea, creatinine, which are less than 500 Daltons. But we also have we also have metabolites that are greater than 500 Daltons that have to be removed. So you require <coughs> you require larger pores. So the so your larger contaminants or your larger metabolites can be removed. But now the problem is, but you also have blood cells or you also have white blood cells, red blood cells, or some proteins uh, like uh, that should not pass through. So that is the challenge here. So you want the pores to be as big as possible to remove your low molecular. So low molecular weight gets removed even if you have small pores. But you want to be able to remove your large, uh, your middle large molecular weight or middle molecular weight solutes as they are called, which are greater than 500 Dalton. But you should not lose your blood cells, your blood proteins, etc. So this is the picture of a high flux membrane. So if you can see the green line at the end, so that's how a normal kidney functions. So okay, so the plot is between clearance and molecular weight. Again, it's a log graph. So it's a, a clearance and uh, the molecular weight. So the normal kidney function is the green one on the extreme. On the extreme, on the extreme. Uh, on the extreme right that you see, this is a normal kidney. So the, a normal kidney has almost 100% clearance for okay. It has it has a almost 100% clearance for up to for up to 10 to the power 4 molecular weight solutes, but none of your none of the membranes that we use can reach here it can never reach here so you have a low flux membrane so that has less than 10 ml or you can have a high flux membrane that has greater than 20 ml 
So, this is ml per meter square per r per mm mercury. So, you can have, uh, so yeah, you could either have a low flux which is commercially available. Nowadays, high flux membranes are available that is greater than 20 ml per meter square per hour, but it never reaches a natural kidney or a real kidney. So, right. <clears throat> so, this is the, this is the representation of Fresnius makes its hollow fiber. So, this is not, I mean, this is just a schematic. So, you have polymer. So, you all, all know uh, hollow fiber membrane preparation, right? Yes. So, uh, the polymer solution and uh, precipitation solution is co-extruded and you have a precipitation bath, rinsing bath and it, so all of this done in biomedical industries is all without human intervention. So because anywhere that you have human intervention, you have chance for error or you have a chance for contamination. So in order to avoid this, the whole process lines are made 100% automatic and that is again one of the challenge why we don't have that manufacturing industries here in India because to make it 100% automatic would require a lot of technology as well as cost. <coughs> okay. So comparing the uh, membranes, so you can have cellulose, modified cellulose or synthetic membranes. Uh, so you can see, uh, okay, so some these are some of these uh, relations for what it is made of and what is the fiber wall. But when you come to the third row, the third row talks about what kind of molecular weight solutes it can remove. So the cellulose can remove, uh, could remove only 3000 Daltons, but the modified and the synthetic ones can remove up to 15000 Daltons. Endotoxin, so this endotoxin is... <clears throat> So, endotoxin is something that comes into the, so that uh, at this endotoxin, so endotoxin is something, so you have basically a membrane, so where you have blood and you have some buffer, so which is known as a dialysate. So you have blood and you have dialysate flowing on, flowing across, I mean flowing in counter current direction across the membrane. So you have your components from blood that diffuse through the membrane and you have larger components that, that do not diffuse. So which are your, your essential components. So now what can happen is this dialysate can, so dialysate is basically a buffer. So this from this buffer also you can have contaminants coming in this way. So this was your blood and this was your dialysis. From the dialysis side also you can have contaminants coming in. So here the synthetic membranes now can retain these kind of endotoxins. They have better biocompatibility, low complement activation and but again a challenge is your adsorption. So it, it depends on what it is adsorbing. Okay, so these are the images of uh, like, so these are both hollow fiber, one is a symmetric, I mean, so one is symmetric cellulose membrane and one is an asymmetric polysulfone membranes. So diameters are given, so these are again commercially existing or commercially available membranes, the photographs I've just borrowed from the internet, yeah. So this is again, so most of the membranes, as you know, you use asymmetric membranes. So this is the blood side, which is your tighter side or which is your selective layer. And this is the one that faces the dialysate side. So as you can see, the number of pores or the pore density is much larger on the dialysate side compared to the blood side. So that is why you have the risk of endotoxin diffusion or back diffusion because the pores at the dialysate side are much larger than at your blood side. Okay, so some of the physico chemical properties of the membranes that is uh, required is, okay, so if your membrane is very hydro or highly hydrophilic, it can, it has a tendency to swell. So anything that takes in water or absorbs water will swell. So what that, when that happens, what happens is you lose your pore size. So let's say that you said your pore size was some nanometers, but when it swells, the pore size can increase or su subsequent pore sizes can decrease because one part, one side or one site has expanded. 
now when it is okay so but that helps with when it is hydrophilic that helps to prevent proteins from adsorbing onto your membrane because it lowers the hydrophobic hydrophobic interaction or water walls interaction but if your membrane is hydrophobic it won't swell so your your pore size or your pore size distribution is constant but it will adsorb your proteins do you want me to say that again okay fine so it can't be extremely hydrophilic it can't be extremely hydrophobic you need a balance somewhere in between uh, so you go something for a mixed copolymers like hydrophobic with hydrophilic domains so for example polysulfone so polysulfone has both hydrophobic or the carbon chains and it has a sulfone sulfone groups right the do you all know the structure of the polysulfone yes the double bond s so you have the so that has hydrophobic backbone with hydrophilic domains okay so polysulfone that is why it is used and coming to the charge of the membrane so one was the hydrophobicity and one was the charge so charge so depending on the charge it can re reduce the endotoxin diffusion or the or the likelihood of endotoxin diffusion can be reduced by the charge depending on what charge your membrane has and okay again if your membrane is negatively charged all your so that if your membrane is negatively charged it repels all your proteins or all your biomolecules from attaching to it because most of the biomolecules at the ph of at the blood ph of 7.4 are negatively charged <clears throat> okay so the three things or three main aspects to membranes for uh, hemodialysis is your solute transport definitely so we spoke about different types of solutes your water transport so apart from the uh, metabolites or solutes that have to be removed water or excess water that that is generated in the body also has to be removed and the third one is the biocompatibility i am not going too much into detail but i will show you some images of something that we had done on biocompatibility okay so in ultra filtration and at low operating pressures the mode of transport or mode of mode of transport of solute across the membrane is diffusion so your operating pressures are not too high but you have a concentration difference so as a result you have diffusion so when you have diffusion so mm, so at from fix law so diffusion so when your size of your molecule increase how does it affect the diffusion it reduces and what about the distance it has to travel so if it has to travel longer distances your diffusion is low so it the one of the limiting factors is your membrane thickness if your membrane is very thick it takes more time it can diffuse the solutes but it takes more time so the patient who undergoes hemodialysis has to be uh, has to be plugged in i mean not plugged in has to be connected to the system for it they are already connected for 3 to 4 hours but they have to be connected for much longer so who would agree to that uh, so increase uh, cellulose clearances uh, so over the last 20 years you had lot of changes you, they nowadays they make very ultra thin fibers or ultra thin membranes uh, selective layers so that your diffusion resistance can be removed so hydrophobic membranes that absorb protein layer can have reduced in vivo clearance so again if if your membrane is predominantly hydrophobic it absorbs so apart from apart from the bio incompatibility associated with it you can also have reduced uh, in vivo clearance so in vivo is not exactly in the uh, not exact not in blood but in a simulated system okay so these are basically the sizes so you have urea that is marked in red which is very small that is around 60 dalton then you have creatinine that is around 112 dalton and you have beta 12 micro microglobulin that is around i think 13500 dalton so you have such a large variation in solutes that you want to remove and so you need a membrane that removes both basically okay so these are the yeah so these are the uh, <clears throat> Okay, so these are the uh, based on its molecular weight so these are this is basically an increasing molecular weight 
So, the smallest ones or the toughest ones to remove are, I mean, so urea is the most com most abundantly occurring. So, the concentration of urea is very high or it is the most abundantly occurring pollutant or uh, toxin that has to be removed. But also you have build up of smaller molecular weight like sodium, phosphorus, etc. that also have to be removed and creatinine is 113 Dalton. Then you have slightly higher like glucose that has to be removed, vitamin B12, 1355 that has to be removed and you even larger, uh, larger solutes like beta 12 microglobin, 11800 Daltons that have to be removed. But your, uh, mem your membrane should not allow the passage of albumin, albumin is around 55,000 or 57,000 kilo Dalton or 57,000 Dalton, kilo Dalton. So, this it should not remove beyond this, but below this all of it has to be removed. So, that is okay. So, that was about solute. So, you have a lot of classes of solutes that have to be removed and then your proteins that should not be removed. Coming to water transport, so water transport, so we, we, uh, we saw a slide initially on the water transport, so you have low flux membranes, high flux or super high flux membranes. So you say it is low flux if it is the your ultra filtration coefficient value is less than 10 ml per hour per mmHg per meter square and you say it is a high flux membrane if it is greater than 20. So, you like so the initial dialy dialyzers all were low flux, but today you have even high flux membranes. So, then the time that that is used for hemodialysis has drastically come down or not drastically, but it has reduced or the number of sessions. So, once so ESRD or the end stage renal disease is an irrecoverable this thing. It is not like some other disease where you regain your kidney function, you can never regain. So, the rest of the patient's natural life he or she has to undergo this dialysis. So, if you have to undergo four times a week or if you have to undergo two times a week makes it makes a very large difference. So, that is why you have I mean nowadays they have developed these high flux ultra filtration membranes. Okay. So, bio compatibility in some some literatures referred to as hemocompatibility or blood compatibility is something your membrane has to be inert to uh, to activation basically any kind of activation. So, these uh, biological systems are it is like a cascade of activation series. So, once your, your proteins adsorption is the first step, then comes your fibrin, fibrinogen. So, it forms a clot, it can activate complements. So, once your complement activation is very severe, it can even lead to death of the patient. So, your membrane should be inert. So, it should not activate or it should not trigger any of the any of the cascades that occur in blood. So, body response are very similar to the inflammatory and immune response. So, like I said, so when you have a rash or when you have an allergic response, so that exactly what happens when the blood is in contact with the uh, hollow fiber membrane. So, that has to be avoided. So, like I said, I am not getting too much into detail of that, but I will show you some things that we have done. So, biocompatibility depends on polymer structures. So, polymer structures that have more hydrophilic groups tend to be more biocompatible simply because they do not allow proteins to adsorb. It is just for that reason, not that the particular group has anything to do with it. It just prevents protein adsorption which is the first step in the cascade of negative reactions that can occur. Then the hydrophobicity, hydrophilicity. So, if it is very hydrophilic, it can it can prevent the adsorption of proteins, but uh, but your pore I mean it swells, membrane swells. So a balance between hydrophobic and hydrophilicity is required. Then the surface charge. So surface charge if if your membrane is charged at the physiological pH. So physiological pH is somewhere at 7.4 or 7.25 to 7.4. The if your membrane is negatively charged, most components in blood will also be negatively charged and it will prevent the attachment of those components in blood on the membrane surface. 
and uh, it depends like i said protein adsorption so protein adsorption is the first step in any of these reactions so but this biocompatible is not always dependent on membrane so there can be patients who have been successfully treated with one type of membrane but some other patient can develop an uh, uh, adverse reaction or a negative reaction to that so it's not always depends on the membrane but it also depends on many other parameters like flow parameters so if you if your flow rates are too high it can shear your blood cells so once the blood cell is sheared all the proteins can pass through again causing negative effects or things like that right, so this is one of the works that i had done during my phd where uh, we have used polyethylamide so polyethylamide is also a uh, an approved material for making for lot of biomedical applications so we have used polyethylamide so there were some advantages uh, and this was bought from sigma aldrich and the limitations of using polyethylamide they were they had a relatively stricter membrane casting conditions lower rejection uh, the it any polymers as such are more hydrophobic than hydrophilic so it has to be modified because the okay, so how are these polymers made or from where what is the source of polymers it is not monomers so to get from monomers to make polymers and that too you buy in 100 grams or 1 kilo uh, 1 kilogram of i mean bottles so it is not exactly mon from monomers to polymers it will take years and the cost will be 10 times higher how are how do you how are polymers made yes it is by cracking of petroleum products yes so petroleum as such is carbon if you see petroleum if you say petroleum it is carbon so anything that comes from petroleum derived products the majority component is carbon right so as such they are all inherently hydrophobic but they have shown to have modified it and used for osteoblasts artificial muscles biocompatible actuators and even in suitable for implantation tests so okay so what i had done here in that work is so we we tried to use some nano materials to modify okay again because so there are different types of approaches so you can surface graft the membrane so making it more hydrophilic or graft to or graft from depending on the context so uh, but with all of those there is always a limitation or there is always a chance that after some time or the, to ensure homogeneity is difficult so we spoke about the uh, fiber diameters do you all remember the fiber diameters yes so they are just 100 microns so if you have to graft the inner surface of 100 to 200 micron inner diameter of your fibers uniformly it may not be possible yes so grafting became out of the question using mixed polymers was the next option that you 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 blend them and you home you form a homogeneous solution and which is extruded to form fibers that is an option another option that now they are using because but except one except containing silver there are no other uh, there are no other hemodialysis membranes containing any nanomaterial because there's always a risk of anything that you use in the in your hemodial i mean in the uh, mod membrane module which comes in contact with the blood it may be leached into the blood or it, it itself can form an adverse reaction so except for silver that that too there's only one type of membrane that uses nanomaterial so there are no nanomaterial made membranes or nanomaterial included membranes that are used for hemodialysis but so we tried using different types of bio compatible materials so carbon materials were chosen firstly primarily because they were inert any as such carbon materials are inert and then if you oxidize them you generate their or you increase their hydrophilicity so like graphene oxide uh, functionalized graphene oxide. So, in functionalized graphene oxide, so we had um, <coughs> so using polydopamine, we had anchored heparin or heparin like salts. So, heparin is an anticoagulant that is used. So, like we discussed before, so continuous anticoagulation is required when hemodialysis is run. So, heparin is the most, or today that is the most commonly used anticoagulant, except for some patients who developed allergic reactions to heparin but that's the most widely used anticoagulant so we tried to immobilize heparin onto the graphene oxide sheets again using a biopolymer or a biolinker which is your polydopamine so the chemistry part this every i hope everyone knows that yeah 
and another was the uh, multi carbon uh, carbon nanotube so the carbon nanotubes are now used almost in every aspect of every aspects they are used like ranging from adsorption to reaction to etc so we have tried to use these also so again they are chemically inert and they have so once you functionalize them or once you oxidize them they also have a large number of carboxylic acid groups which again renders them hydrophilic so this is one of the works where we use graphene oxide nanocomposite incorporated membranes uh, into polyetheramide for hemodialysis. So this was the first work, okay. I'm going to skip this. So the graphene oxide was prepared and again now the always the question is what is the source of your graphene oxide that is prepared because prepared from different sources you tend to have different yields. But more or less once you standardize your this thing you are able to get a uniform distribution or uniform sheet distribution for graphene oxide. So they are, they, after that they were characterized, TEM, XRD, UV, etc. And then we have incorporated them directly into the membrane. So they are the weight percentages. So as you can see the loading of the graphene oxide is very very low. It's just 0.2 weight percent of your polyetheramide. So it's at that low concentration nanomaterials are able to tune polymer properties or tune polymer channel introduce hydrophilicity and you can see the color. So these are just the photographs of on the right side. You can see the color of the membranes from 0 to 2 weight percent it is very dark and uh, yeah so that is the membrane. So here as the first case they were prepared only as a flat sheet. And they were again tested that all the graphene oxide that you've incorporated is there on the surface or is not there. And you want the graphene oxide to be on the surface rather than in the bulk because that is what comes in contact with your blood. Uh, so the pristine M0 membrane showed a surface charge of minus 18.2. So most polymers again negatively charged which increased to minus 30.2 millivolts for the membrane that had graphene oxide incorporated. So the membrane surface charge had also decreased or the negative value of the surface charge had also increased so that the membrane has become more negatively charged. Again because of the addition of the graphene oxide that has the OH and the carboxylic acid groups. So this is the morphology changing on loading of the graphene oxide. And uh, here, I don't know if you could see at this magnification, but the skin layer thickness increased when we had an increase in graphene oxide. So basically, so we spoke about the liquid-liquid demixing during the formation of membranes, right? So on addition of a hydrophilic, so graphene oxide being hydrophilic, the delay in demixing reduced or it quickened the liquid-liquid demixing. As a result, you form thinner, uh, thinner uh, surface or skin layers. Again, some AFM and the contact angle. So the contact angle and the work of adhesion were also calculated. So basically the young Dupree equation, which is uh, pretty much easy to do. So you could see that the pristine membrane had a water contact angle of closer to 75. And on addition of just 0.2 weight percent, the contact angle decreased to less than 50. So these were some of the calculations that we had used, I mean very commonly used ones, so ultrafiltration rates, rejections and flux recovery. Okay, so here, okay, so <clears throat> we spoke about some solutes have to, have to be removed whereas some proteins have to be retained. So what is the size of these, okay, what is the smallest uh, protein that is present in human human blood. What is the size or what is the protein and what is its size? Hmm? Yes. So the human serum albumin is the one that is the smallest protein present in the blood. Size is somewhere around 68, 68 kilo Dalton. Yes. So that is the smallest protein. Okay. So we used instead of human serum albumin which is much costlier we used the bovine serum albumin which and the bovine serum albumin retention was 98, 97 and it, it decreased a bit when your pore sizes increased and the mean pore size was calculated and you could see the porosity also increased when you added nanomaterials because they act as small channels because again 
they are hydrophilic and they try to go to the water during the phase inversion process and they form uh, small channels. Okay, so if the patient during hemodialysis loses the human serum albumin, a syndrome known as uh, albumin loss associated al syndrome occurs and that it should be avoided again which is negative uh, this thing. So the membrane ultrafiltration rates and it's so ultrafiltration increased drastically from 6.8 ml per hour per meter square per mmHE. So this is not in terms of liter per meter square hour which you generally see in water treatment application, this is in ml. So this had increased to 35 from 6.8 and also its flux recovery was also much higher on addition of the uh, <coughs> graphene oxide. So the, pro, the bio compatibility or the blood compatibility has to be assessed and the first step like I said was the protein adsorption. So if proteins adsorb on your uh, hemodialysis membrane, further cascade of negative reactions happen. So first we tested for protein adsorption. So we used uh, bovine serum albumin and bovine fibrinogen which are the two uh, commonly or l most widely present or in quantity wise, in most widely present proteins that are present in blood. So these are the bovine forms. So you can find, I mean, in the blood, in human blood, you have the human forms. Okay. Uh, so the fibrinogen adsorption is the first step in the cascade of unsuitable events. And as you can see in the graph, the protein adsorption was given in, <coughs> in microgram per centimeter square of the membrane. Yeah, so this is in microgram per centimeter square of the membrane. So to do that, you actually need assays to find that. So, okay, so BSA protein at pH of 7.4 is negatively charged and our membrane surface charge had decreased or the negative charge had increased. So as a result, you can see a loss or a decline in adsorption of both bovine serum albumin as well as the fibrinogen. So again, why? Because again, they are hydrophilic. So there is an increase in so the hydrophilicity. As well as the surface charge. So these two factors affected the, uh, I mean, the, that's why the protein adsorption became lower. So after that is the, so this is a platelet adhesion. So platelets are uh, from the blood. So basically once some clotting starts to occur or the first step in clotting after fibrinogen uh, adsorption is your platelet adhesion and platelet activation. So it's not that the platelets from the blood have to be adsorbed, but it has to, it tends to be elongated or it tends to form a fibrous network. So that was present in the first cases or in the membranes without any graphene oxide and later on that has reduced. Uh, thrombin, anti-thrombin generation and blood clotting times. So blood clotting times is again an indicator of how much heparin to use and uh, how and when your blood could get clotted. So basically you always want your any biomaterial which is in contact with blood to have as high as your as high time as possible. The clotting time should be as much as possible, which again two, two benefits. One, it reduces the amount of anticoagulant that you require and secondly, the, the it's minimized. The, the chance of blood forming blood clots are minimized. So there are a lot of biological theories associated with this, which I don't want to get into, but I just want to talk about here again. This is again the uh, complement activation. So there are many complements that form many intrinsic pathways, extrinsic pathways. So basic, very simply put, they are some allergic reactions that form due to introduction of some foreign species into the blood. In our case, it's different because you're, you are taking out the blood and making it interact with the membrane in order to form, perform your separation. So anything that generates these kind of complement activation is very, very difficult or very scary to deal with. Like I said, it could even cause the death of the patient. 
Then finally we did the solute permeation. So we did it in a re complete total recycle mode where we ran it for 2 to 3 hours and we saw how much of urea had diffused, how much of creatinine. So these were done individual ways. So, so first had first solution had only urea, then we had took a solution of only of creatinine and then we saw over 3 hours or 4 hours what was the concentration in the feed compartment, what was the concentration in the uh, in the permeate compartment. So we did it for urea which is 60 Dalton, we did for vitamin B12, so that is around 1300 Dalton and we did for cytochrome C. So cytochrome C is somewhere around 14,000 Dalton, it is basically instead of the beta 2 microglobulin, cytochrome C is a colored molecule. So you can by just by using your uh, micro titer UV, you can uh, determine what was what had happened or how much, what is the concentration. <coughs> Yeah. So apart from blood compatibility, the cell cytocompatibility. So cytocompatibility is like how many live cells are there, like how many deaths, like does the does the cells die when in contact with blood? So this was used uh, hepatocyte cells, uh, and again a staining was done. So that is the acridine orange ethidium bromide staining. So the green color, the live cells take up one particular color and or one particular dye and the dead cells because they lose its cell wall they take up the other kind of dye so the red cells I mean uh, red cells translate to the dead cells and the green are the live cells. So the attachment overall attachment is low. So usually when you immerse it in a cell containing medium or a cell culture medium the whole thing is supposed to be showing you a green color basically it is supposed to attach and grow on it but this shows that our uh, membranes are such do not facilitate the adsorption of the or do not facilitate the attachment and growth of the cells. At the same time the modified membranes show very less cell death that means in case even if you have attachment the cells that die are, are much less. So okay so that was the first work. So in the second work we move to the multi wall carbon nanotubes again oxidized basically to give you the negative, uh, negative charge. All these are just uh, character, routine characterizations that we do. Okay, so here, apart from the flat sheet membranes, we've also made hollow fiber membranes. So this was just a schematic of a hollow fiber membrane. So the hollow fiber membranes were again made with uh, a slightly more, uh, slightly higher concentration than the flat sheet membranes of polymer because you need a lot more viscosity for it to form uh, uniform fibers. Yes. So uh, this uh, apart uh, both flat sheet as well as hollow fiber membranes were run and they both were all the same tests were done all the characterizations all the tests and the solute clearance was also done. So this was again we had done some more uh, biocompatibility studies where we actually used in this study human serum albumins and human gamma globulins uh, of the relative adsorption of that and then this you can see how the so this is the platelet adhesion so in the first image you can see how the it is forming a fibrous network basically the uh, platelets have adhered and they form a fibrin network and in the in the last and in and as the uh, concentration increase or concentration of the multi wall carbon nanotubes increased you can see that so here you have like it has spread out and form a fibrous structure and as the concentration increase though there are adsorption you it, it has not formed this kind of a or this kind of a fibrous structure. And here the uh, total adsorption is much lower. Yeah. Uh, so again, uh, same tests of platelet activation and clotting times were taken. So the hemolysis ratio. So hemolysis is if the blood cells, if the surface is too rough. And or if the shear force is too high, so we have done it in a in uh, in just by immersion, which is not actually uh, the correct way to do it because here in this case you have the blood that is flowing. It is not that blood is collected in a uh, in a sample bottle or in a cuvette, and we just add a membrane and we see. So this is just an approximation, but as such, the membranes did not show any hemolysis. But when it flows, definitely there is hemolysis. We cannot say there is a process without hemolysis of the blood because. Uh, because it, it flows through a 1 meter square membrane module. 
Uh, so these are again cell culture, so these are for a different type of, so Chang liver cell lines, again you can see some adsorption, some growth, etc. And so these are, so the MTT assay was done for maybe over 72 hours, so 3 days and you could see the growth. So these were seeded maybe after 3 days only and then you could see how much attachment and growth happened and then you can still see some dead cells. So you can't say that there are no dead cells but overall the attachment is not as high that you don't want very high attachment of your, I mean, of anything to your membrane. So these were the characteristics of the hollow fiber membranes that we have made. So these had a, a inner diameter of 220 micrometers and a wall thickness. So the wall thickness of uh, around 45 to 55 micrometers. And you can see how the, uh, how the morphology changes when we include uh, when we add the uh, functionalized multi-wall carbon nanotube. So you can see it becomes, there are large number of smaller pores are generated but the, the longer pores have reduced and the thickness also is somewhat higher because the, visc the dope solution had become more viscous. Hmm, mechanical properties and adsorption. So multi-wall carbon nanotubes are uh, good adsorbers. So we just uh, we just checked that if they were able to adsorb any of these contaminants or any of these metabolites. So we use creatinine. So it could adsorb creatinine. Uh, I mean, at at different concentrations of creatinine and at different flow rates, it could adsorb. So in a static condition or in an adsorption mode, they showed 70, 51, and 57 percent of creatinine removal and maximum adsorption occurred within the first half an hour and after that there was no further, I mean much increase in the adsorption. Ultra filtration rate, so the ultra filtration rate, so these are for the hollow fiber membranes, so they were around 48, so we have used very small hollow fibers, so that was around 5 to 10 fibers itself. So it, the ultra filtration rate was but improved from 14 ml per hour per meter square per mmHg to 48 and the BSA retention use uh, here was better than the previous flat sheet membranes where greater than 98% BSA retention was there. And so these studies are somewhat similar to or these results are somewhat similar to the commercial membranes that are sold by Fresenius or Asahi etc. And uh, uremic solute removal, so, at, so when the uh, hemodialysis is run in a counter current flow, by increasing the flow rates, definitely you can change the mass transfer characteristics and you can improve the diffusion. But blood, you cannot, imp you cannot increase the blood side flow rate beyond a point, but the dialysis side flow rate was improved, uh, was changed from 200 ml per minute to 350 ml per minute. And here we saw that, uh, so the yellow colored lines mark at 200 and it is always slightly higher for the, at when it's run at a higher flow rate or when the dialysate side flow rate is higher. So for both creatinine as well as cytochrome C. So the advantage of this work was there was no significant pressure drop or channeling when use of these high efficiency membranes unlike hermoperfusion. So, so these membranes I said they had, uh, they had advantage or they could adsorb creatinine even in static condition. Hermoperfusion works only on the base of adsorption. So unlike, so basically it's a packed bed in, through which you pass the blood and it has to adsorb or the contaminants adsorb. So this does both by transport by diffusion as well as removal of, so, removal of these uremic toxins by hemoperfusion. So creatinine clearance and diffusion at higher adsorption rate would reduce the dialysis duration, elevating the discomfort of the patient. So the last one was on the heparin bio anchor to graphene oxide, the same thing. Here we have converted into a much larger module and we have done the same work. So these are the SEMM. So the fibers now, so we have, we were able to improve our spinning capabilities. The fibers now are very thin, so any time that you try to break it to take a SEM image, the fiber sags and it's very difficult to get a SEM image as such because it's much thin. Yeah. So they were fabricated with the help of our industrial partner which was part of our project. Uh, they are based in um, IIT Kharagpur. They, they are a startup from IIT Kharagpur. So it was a three center, uh, this thing, so IIT Bombay, IIT Karakpur and then we were doing that. So, the, huh? 
no no it was not it was with a full with a laser line control and full manufacturing setup because with tabletop we can't get this small uh, fibers you need a continuous winding drum with, with in a fully enclosed chamber that does not change in humidity etc because other fibers keep breaking in you can't say fully automated, but it is a full scale spinning. So, with no human intervention, is there or they, they till, till the spinning and collection, there is no human intervention, but the packing and potting are human intervened. Yeah. Okay, so these were again then characterized by the same techniques. I'm not going into that again and again. Okay, so here the interesting thing is since we had loaded heparin onto the graphene oxide, the uh, the clotting time, so the clotting times had drastically improved to around 200 seconds. So which shows that uh, like the, the heparin 1 was active and it was available and the clotting times were higher. So it might significantly reduce the amount of heparin anticoagulant that is required. Uh, solute rejection rates, urea and lysosome. So lysosome is again a middle molecular weight solutes that were taken and at the end of the run. So these were uh, run for I think 4 hours and this was the solute reduction ratio. So solute in the initial, solute in the feed side was measured initially and at the end of 4 hours. And so this is a, okay, so this is just a comparison of what our work was done and then it had gone for a patent and all. So this was what, uh, so this was compared to a commercial Fresenius membrane and this was our hollow fiber membrane. Uh, a small increase in ultrafiltration coefficient is there and the effective membrane area we used were less because again if you pack it manually, you are not able to get more than a particular way because you can't squeeze the fibers. But when it's done automated and they have lot of kinds of technology that they have wavy type of fibers where the, num the packing density is very high. So blood flow rate was tested in uh, 150 to 300 and almost the same. Wall thickness was close by. So the membrane was polysulfone for Fresenius and we had the PEI plus graphene oxide. And uh, we could remove 63% beta 2 microglobulin within two hours. And okay, those were in, definitely steam sterilized, ours was not. And, but it could be steam sterilized because it's thermally stable. So then this was done a small in vivo, not a small, so we had, this was a phase one of using rabbits. Okay, I'm just going to quickly move through that. So uh, the dialysis was run by taking, I mean, the it's a continuous mode dialysis where rabbits were used in the study. So it's a specific type of rabbits that were used, with, I mean, which had much, much more weight because human blood, there's only one tenth of the human weight is blood. So. Indian rabbits are around 2 or 3 kilos, so you have only like 20 ml blood, but these are like 7 to 8, so you have around 70, 700 ml of blood, right. And with that, I'm going to end my talk and I thank you all for your patient listening. Yes. <clears throat> Which? These are already published. Yeah. Oh, this was not done technically here, this was my part of my PhD work couple of years back but yeah so this was this had moved to small animal model was done and now it's the trials are going on in large animal models like horses and dogs but i have come out of it because i am not associated with that anymore right yeah so any uh, any takers for that question <clears throat> So the membrane, first question is the membrane resistance, is it <coughs> fixed or does it change? It's fixed? Yes. So then how would we determine the resistance of the membrane? You all might be doing that, right, for as part of your research. <coughs> By measuring the water flux of clean membrane using water as feed. So, I mean, whatever solution you want as feed. So, water in most cases, so as water. Right. So, from Darcy's law, I think every, we have both 
of us that discuss about Darcy's law. So, from Darcy's law, determination of flux, where it is directly proportional to pressure, inversely proportional to the thickness, inversely proportional to the viscosity, and you have a constant of uh, yeah, so what was Darcy's law? Yeah, so what was the, the uh, Varun, how do I get the whiteboard here? Any idea? Or uh, you can get in that, right? Yes, you can, you can get in that, yeah. This is, no. Just share this again. No? You can't get a whiteboard. Okay, so uh, yes, coming back to Darcy's law. So, what was the Darcy's law? Hmm. And inversely proportional to dynamic viscosity and inversely proportional to thickness. Yes, thank you. So, so flux is directly proportional to the pressure drop or pressure driven process inversely proportional to the uh, and inversely proportional to the resistance and the con you have a constant of proportionality. Yes, and so your resistance comes from delta. Into R, where R is your total resistance. But R is your total resistance. So the total resistance is sum of all your resistances. You can have resistance of the membrane, resistance of the K clear, and even maybe resistance due to the gel formation, right? Okay. What is the next? Pore size distribution, selectivity, virus filtration capabilities have to be employed commercially. Oh, sorry, have to be determined, such as the methods to determine these parameters. How do we find pore size distribution? Hmm? Yes. Why? What is it? Porometry, what is the principle of porometry? And you can find your radius, right? By, by, increase, by increasing the pressure, you can find your bubble pore and pore size distribution. Sorry? Yes, 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 by slowly increasing pressure. So you have both intrusion porometer or, or mercury porosimetry, whatever. Then selectivity, how do you determine selectivity? So that is the first part. So how do you determine pore size? How do you determine selectivity? Selective, what do you mean by selectivity? So if you have two compounds A and B that have to be separated, 
how do you how do you say the membrane is how much more selective for a yeah you have to find the concentration it's a direct experiment in uh, so if it's by diffusion driven after some time you measure both concentration in feed side so you get the concept of alpha right what is alpha yes so it is in the concentration of concentration of a to b in phase 1 by concentration of a to b in phase 2 1 and 2 are just the uh, feed and the permeate not not written it feed and the permeate this one this is okay Okay. It can be any way, right? It, it is just relative. It can be any way. So, if pro or if it is ratios in 1 and 2 basically in the two phases and virus filtration. So, virus filtration is something you all heard this thing. So, there is a particular virus, particular concentration and they check how much is the removal. It should technically be a log 7 removal. It should be a log 7 removal. So, what do you mean by log 4, log 7 removal and all? Huh? Yeah, concentration. What do you mean by log 7 removal? If I say a log 7 removal, what does that mean? Seven? Cycles. Not cycles. So you you say in log two you, there has been a log two reduction or a log three reduction. What does that mean? Seven times is correct. So it should your rejection should be ninety nine point nine nine nine. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Log 2 means it is 99 percent. Yes? So, you can have only one particle per 1, mil, one million uh, cells. Your permeate, if you, if you have 1 million cells that have permeated through, in that only one of them is allowed to be a virus. So, there is a particular virus, a very small virus that yesterday he spoke about, if you all remember. That, yeah, and some it should be in a concentration because these are standard tests. There should be some particular concentration to be able to do this virus filtration. Right. Okay, so the next one. So, those are relatively easy, the four membrane modules and advantages and disadvantages. Yes, anyone who does not, who wants me to say that? No, right? You want me to say that? Okay. So, the four membrane, what are the four membrane modules? Flat sheet is not a spiral wound is spiral wound. tubular, hollow fiber and plate and frame, yes. Right. So, what are the two mechanisms that dis, uh, describe transport in porous and non-porous membrane? So, in porous membrane, what is? Yeah. Solution diffusion is for? Yeah. Solution diffusion. For non-porous. I'm just keeping as NP, non-porous, and size exclusion. Size exclusion is for? Yeah. 
porous right is there any other mechanisms that you know of what is that uh, no donan exclusion is okay but that is not a mechanism so donan exclusion is not a mechanism of of pressure driven process donan is correct donan for what do you use donan exclusion it's charge based especially for electrodialysis nuts and diffusion is okay but what is the um, what is the model pore diffusion is same as size exclusion so this is also sometimes known as pore diffusion there is a dual sorption theory by paul and koros that you can check that that's fine but these are the two main one so here okay that's fine no, i don't want to go into that yeah the next question so how can concentration polarization be uh control to inhibit flux losses during pressure driven membrane separation right so there are many there are many techniques so okay first what is concentration polarization all of you are aware right yes no so basic very simply put i'll just say that again so very simply put when you are having uh so this is your membrane when you are having some permi uh, some feed that is by the application of pressure when you have water flowing through some solutes are not some solutes are not uh, retained by the particular i mean sorry some solutes are retained by the membrane it is not allowed to pass through so what happens it at at very close to this at basically the boundary layer or very close to that you have an accumulation of salt so the concentration here in the bulk and the concentration here at the membrane interface is not the same so because so this is known as concentration polarization okay so how do you avoid this so one is tangential flow compared to dead end flow then one second yeah so one is tangential flow filtration then reduce the pressure of operation okay but you generally don't have a control because you want to have maximum flux you can reduce the pressure it will delay it will delay the concentration polarization it will not avoid ha huh? back reg intermittent intermittent backwash so if it's for a dead end in dead end filtration you increase the flow or increase the shear by stirring basically you increase the reynolds number so it no longer acts as a laminar flow so that's the thing then higher feed velocities so when velocity is increase it and that to again in tangential flow only it removes the pollutants that have been i mean that that are accumulating at the surface then yes surface modification of membrane of membrane And yeah you are saying yeah ph i mean maybe we can't touch the feed because the feed is something that exists you can use a pre treatment so you use a pre treatment right okay shall we go ahead 
what are some specific requirements for membranes used in bio separation i want you all, i want you to find this out yourself because you all have heard 3 days of lectures so I, this i will leave it to you <clears throat> the last one so from the analysis of bio process water you find lot of contaminants how do you separate them so basically you need to know size so in pressure driven process all are separated based on size so you need to know the size of each of those contaminants like red blood cells or your virus or your ions or glucose or whatever is present then you can map it against you which one is it like do, is it microfiltration is it ultrafiltration nanofiltration or reverse osmosis right so i think it's fairly easy i think you all can manage yes okay thank you